entering the National Assembly as a representative of the people, it's an honor. It is a privilege that not many Guyanese would share. And so I want to thank the people of Guyana who repose confidence, first of all, in the coalition, APNU plus AFC, and then in my party, the Alliance for Change, for believing in me and for elevating me to that very high office of serving the people of Guyana. Mr. Campbell, there is no replacing Raphael Trotman. <laughs> you know, he has such a great capacity for research and for debate. You know, he can see things from perspectives that few people would see at first. And so for me, you know, they, I am not replacing Raphael Frothman. The good thing about me is that, the good thing for me, sorry, is that he has promised that he will be there to help me and to guide me, to mentor me through Parliament. And so while I am in Parliament, I'm taking up the seat vacated by Ron, Raphael Frothman, I am not replacing Raphael Frothman. There is no replacing Raphael Frothman. As I enter into Parliament, there are some areas that I I'm keen about and one of them and this is the whole reason why I got into politics to begin with is to help to develop a more just society you know when, when you look across our landscape you see persons who are marginalized persons who don't believe that they're getting a fair share of the pie and I believe that we have to find some way of correcting that after every election cycle Almost half the population feel as though they're being left out. They're not getting their fair share. I mean, like 50 plus years after independence, we have to find a way to remedy that. Do you consider it a large task for one person? Uh, oh no, <laughs> I, I don't think that it, you know, it's just gonna be me. I believe this is the collective view of the Alliance for Change, first and foremost, and our partners, the APLU. And I believe, and I would want to believe strongly, that even the PPP would come to realize that we cannot continue to govern in this way. We're half the population every time, just feeling as though, you know, they're left out. I am 101% certain and assured that I answer to a higher caller. And so there, there is no compromise on that. Once my conscience, based on my religious belief, dictate that I move in a particular direction, that will take precedent. I, I don't compromise on that. And so it becomes very simple. Anytime my, my integrity and my beliefs are called into question and my party cannot see with that, well, then we will have to part ways because I'm a strong believer that I will answer to my God. Some of the things we see happening in the National Assembly, you know, when I was in the media another lifetime ago, um, I covered the National Assembly and, and there was heckling, but it was not vile, it was not rabid. You know, not some of the comments we see coming from both sides. I'm not going to blame any one side here, you know. And we need to get back to that. The quality of debate that you had, you know, um, recently it was the death anniversary of Winston Murray, such a great guy, you know, and so we need to get back, it, it may call for some training, and I hope that the parliament would invest in training members and parties would invest in training members, but we need to get back there. And I refuse to get into, into anything ugly in the National Assembly, I just refused, as I said, I answered to a higher calling. And so I'm going to be playing keen interest in the environment, especially as it relates to the natural resources sector. You know, we have uh, waste plants that are going to be built for the oil and gas sector. Oil and gas produces hazardous waste, you know. So I want to pay attention there to make sure that we leave no long-term damage to the environment. Uh, I would like to know that we start doing some studies on the marine life offshore to ensure that when oil and gas sector starts winding down that our marine resources are not damaged permanently. 
So, yes, I have an interest there. I have an interest in the development of our hinterland. When Mighty King Sugar started its decline, our economy depended heavily on the resources from the hinterland, the gold, the diamond, the bauxite, the, to some extent, and timber. And so those were the sectors propping up our economy and it, it paved our roads, it built our schools on the coastland. Now that we have found oil wealth, I would like to see that the hinterland is really developed. I would like to know that the children of the hinterland, they do not have electricity for just a few hours a day. They must have electricity at night so that they can study as many hours as the students on the hinterland. They must have access to the internet 24-7 so that they can do their research. Those are areas that I would want to push, I would want to advance, I would want to see developed. Because when you look at the results coming out at uh, CSEC, at CAPE, at the NGSA, you file, seldom find within that top bracket students from the hinterland. And I refuse to believe that they are any less capable of learning. It's the resources with which we provide them. The teachers, we've got to make sure that we provide some of the best teachers to the hinterland. We've got to make sure that those teachers are provided with the wherewithal, the internet, the housing, the uh, aids for the classroom, so that they can work with the students of the hinterland. I would want to see more hinterland businesses develop. When we look at the, our business community, Tell me, where do we find uh, an Amerindian who has a business that employs 20 or 25 people? You know, and don't tell me that they are not capable of running a business or they have no interest in running business. I refuse to believe that. We have to give them the opportunity. And so it may call for some sort of form of affirmative action, but I believe that all the people of this country must have equitable access to develop and to grow and to share in our economic pie.